monument that you are seeing right now was dedicated here in 1908 um, and has been maintained ever since. Uh, we have another uh, Veterans Memorial Monument in Bethel uh, located up on the common, but that's the later one. Today what will be happening is that several units of Maine Civil War Militia will be marching down. They will be marching down and there will be a rededication of this monument. Uh, there was some desire uh, on the part of the committee to inscribe this monument with names of Bethelites who have been, uh, were in that civil struggle between 1861 and 1865. However, for two reasons at least, uh, the Bicentennial Committee decided uh, not to interfere with that. One being that even though we might have many of the uh, approximately, I believe, 189 names, uh, we always might be missing one or because of poor record keeping or um, regional lack of discrimination. It might be including somebody who is not actually a Bethelite, uh, but the most overwhelming um, reason seemed to be that this monument is in itself an historic um, part of the town of Bethel and of that era. It is a period piece and needs to be a standalone. At some time, there may be an effort, uh, and we're fairly certain that uh, may happen, uh, to erect a tablet of some kind that will identify uh, the soldiers who were, if not officially, but at least informally associated with the town of Bethel. We've been told that the street was going to be blocked off to traffic, but it isn't, and we're getting a lot of disturbance by that um, at this point. The program that's going to happen today is being uh, presented by several militia groups, and they are the, of the main infantry, the first, Seventh, ninth, tenth, twelfth, thirteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth, and twentieth, twenty-second, twenty-third, twenty-ninth, and thirtieth, thirty-first, and thirty-second volunteer regiment of Maine Artillery, the fourth, fifth, seventh volunteer regiment. Uh, this weekend, the hosts are the seventh uh, Maine volunteer. Uh, regiment, uh, of which Jim Rose, who is chairman of this event, uh, is a member.
Good morning. Welcome to the Bicentennial Civil War Heritage Weekend. I'll try again. Welcome. Welcome to the Bethel Bicentennial Civil War Weekend. I'd like to thank every one of the attendants today. I'd like to thank every... Everyone who has donated their time, resources to help make this a reality. I would like to thank all of the reenactment units for coming and spending time with us this weekend. Now, when I uh, started thinking about what to say today, it was very difficult. So many different ways to approach something like this. Yep. Some historical records. Of some Bethel men that served. I ran across something and solved all my problems. The account I'd like to share with you as representative of why we're here today. First, I must tell you very briefly the story of the 6th Main, 16th Main, excuse me, infantry at Gettysburg. On the first day of Gettysburg, all the Union lines are being driven back a superiorly enforced Confederate artillery and, and uh, infantry. As they were falling back, suddenly the 16th Maine realized being left slightly exposed and they started to retreat back to their line because they were rather sticking out like a sore thumb. Just about that time, they were ordered to do an about face charge to hold that spot in the line at all costs until the Union reset its lines behind them. He was to say they got cut off. They were completely surrounded. They were down to about 40, 50, 60 men left. The fighting was savage. They were being hit from almost every side. It was murderous. When it became obvious that no Union reinforcements were going to break through, bail them out, get them out, they realized that they were going to be captured. At that time, the remaining men who were alive formed a ring of bayonets around the color guard. While he tore the flag to pieces, he gave a piece of it to each of the men still alive, rather than surrender the colors to the Confederates. The Confederates themselves, to see what was happening, did as postulated that they were so moved by their devotion to their flag that they slowed their advance to give the color bearer time to finish tearing up the flag and handing it out before they closed into the final capture. When it was done, they were all captured. The unit was disintegrated. Well, leaving that there, I'd like to give you some words from the man who was actually there, to the count. The first thing that the regiment knew, the Confederates appeared on both flank, right and left. Then it was ascertained that the whole Union Army present, except our command, was retiring towards Gettysburg and Cemetery Heights where the battle was to be fought out. Learning this condition, the regiment commenced to fall back in earnest to protect themselves. All at once, General Robinson, the commander of the division, appeared to Colonel Tillman and ordered him to about face, advance his regiment, and attack the advancing rebels. The colonel then undertook him for a moment to explain the position and conditions that we were all cut up, that there was a strong line of rebels not only in front of us, but on both of our flanks. General Robinson, evidently feeling a bit nervous over his own position as he perceived that the flankers to be moving in, rose in the stirrups of his horse and with his hand extended towards Colonel Tilden in a loud voice with energetic words said, Colonel Tilden, take that position and hold it as long as you can until you even have a single man left. The Colonel replied, all right, General, we'll do the best we can. General Robinson wheeled on his horse, gave him the spur, jumped the fence, and disappeared into the woods toward Gettysburg. The colonel then gave the command, about face, fix bayonets, charge. And although every man knew 
but the movement meant death or capture. It was obeyed with a will. The rebel line was driven back and held for a short time until the flank movement on our sides had practically closed in all around us, when every man commenced to look after himself without further orders. Firing from this line became not only effective but almost murderous. But the regiment finally surrendered, but the flag did not go down with surrender. It was torn from its staff into small fragments and distributed among the brave boys. I will remember that I threw my sword at a Confederate officer who immediately took me into possession, swore considerably to think that he did not get my sword. Colonel Tilden and the whole regiment were taken captive. From that position we occupied when we were surrounded, we could not see how a single man could have gotten away. And that night, when in the rear under prison guard, talking over the day's battle and of our losses and our condition, Colonel Tilden made the remark that every man who did his duty was either killed, wounded, or captured. There was a young corporal in Company D of the 16th Maine that day. His name was Corporal Charles Potter. He was from Bethel. He was in that small company of men left to stand that fire and guard the colors, and he received a piece of that flag in his pocket rather than see it surrendered to the rebels. The story has been hidden for 130 some odd years. He had a piece of that legacy in his pocket. Unfortunately, it never came home because later that year, Corporal died in a Confederate prisoner of war camp in Richmond, Virginia. If you can appreciate that account, if you can appreciate how those last few men surrounded the color guard with their bayonets, vastly outnumbered, fighting to the death, if you can appreciate why we're having this weekend. So ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes, after some other speakers, the church bell tolled a moment of silence. I would like for you to think of Corporal Think of him not only as above all the other men from Bethel, but as representative of them. Maybe you understand why we feel the way we do. Thank you. As I was walking down here, uh, several people stopped me as I was coming down and asked a lot of questions about the parade and what was going on. One little boy came up to me and said, why are you dressed in that funny uniform? And I thought about it because probably to you folks, all of us here are dressed in funny uniforms. And I guess the key to that is the fact that we are dressed in it and that people will come up to us and ask those questions. And it's those very questions which keep alive the memory of those people that we're here to remember today. I have before me a list of those of those me pardon me those members of the 16th Maine uh, from the town of Bethel who fought in the Civil War. But I want to say though, I don't want to say too much about the 16th Maine because there were 31 infantry regiments and one heavy artillery regiment and seven artillery units and two cavalry units that served the, state, the federal government uh, from the state of Maine in the Civil War. And the town of Bethel undoubtedly contributed a number of people to many of those regiments, probably not all, but many of them. The regiments that we tend to remember, the regiments like the, uh, the 20th Maine, the 16th Maine, those regiments are the ones whose names we seem to pick out of the, uh, 
out of the list and say, uh, you know, this person was from Bethel, this person was from whatever, whatever town, and this person served the state of Maine. I want to mention and maybe read a very short story about a couple of the men from this town uh, and perhaps give you an idea that although all of them served, and all of them served, of course, bravely, um, each one of them was an individual and each one of them was undoubtedly a character. The, uh, the last name of Bean is, um, the name was Peter Bean of Bethel, and he was uh, uh, 34 years old in 1862 when he joined the uh, 16th Maine. Uh, he was wounded at Fredericksburg, and the 16th Maine was involved in a very deadly charge, not around Mary's Heights, but actually in the southern part of the battlefield, and he was wounded there. He returned to the regiment in June of 62, of 63 rather, just in time for the Battle of Gettysburg, and he too was captured at Gettysburg. And he too had a, a portion of that flag that he carried with him probably for the rest of his life. Uh, as a matter of fact, he moved away and actually died in, uh, in Shuler, Nebraska, in September 1883. Uh, I'm reminded of some other names as well. Let me read you a short account. Charles Locke of Bethel, who was mustered as 5th Sergeant on August 14, 1862, it says he was a popular man and wore a silk hat and kid gloves when he joined the company. On the march to Chancellorsville, it was a hot day. When we got near enough to, the hear, to hear the sound of firing and the sound of battle, he told Captain Lowell that he could not march any longer and must fall out. Captain pointed out to a lot of youngsters along the way and replied, Sergeant, I can't excuse you. Look at those little boys who are keeping up, and you must do so also. He promised to do the best he could, but leaked. He was missing in a short time. It did not put an appearance until after the battle, when he turned up in apparent good order. Soon after, he was reduced to the ranks at his own request. He became a member of the regimental band. He was a genial gentleman. And a good musician. And later in 64, when he was called to task and called to duty, he did serve in battle. Once again, the, the list of names goes on and on here. I'm undoubtedly the number of the people that actually served. I've noticed that it is for the present generation, or perhaps the future generations, to actually place the names of those men on this monument. And I assume that, that will be a, a project that the town will undertake at some point. Um, what I'd like to do, I guess, is to turn this over to my wife, actually, who has something to say about women of the war. Cynthia. Hi, my name is Cindy Dalton. I do have a hard act to follow since that was my husband, Tina. Um, oftentimes, women are forgotten. Uh, they do make a major contribution at home and at the front. Women not only participated at home, they also were soldiers from some different states. I'm not aware of anyone who they fought as a woman. Okay, thanks. But um, if anyone is aware, I would, would like the information. Um, this short speech is dedicated to the loyal women of America and Maine, and I quote from the book, Women's Work in the Civil War by L. P. Rocket. To the loyal women of America, whose patriotic contributions, toils and sacrifices, enabled their sisters whose history is here recorded, to minister relief and consolation to our wounded and suffering heroes, and who by their devotion, their labors, and their patient endurance, deprivation, and distress of body and spirit, called to give up their beloved ones for the nation's defense, have won themselves eternal honor and undying remembrance by the patriots of all time. Since I only have a few minutes to cover such a broad topic as women in the Civil War, I have chosen to focus on a few fine examples of Maine women. The 
made great sacrifices and contributions to the war effort. Most being women have been regulated by tradition to the realm of domestic chores, such as child rearing, cooking, housekeeping, and caring for the sick and elderly. The Civil War thrust men, women, and women from the North and South into another sphere, caring for sick and wounded soldiers. Several men, women followed their husbands and sons to war. Some lead simply, some had the desire to make contributions to the cause. Women such as Ruth Mayer, Mayu, sorry, of Rockland left the scene of war as a nurse for the 4th Maine Regiment. Another example would be Isabella Fogg from Palace. Both Ruth and Isabella were together at the front at the battles of Fair Oaks, Chancellorville, and Gettysburg, to name only a few. Here they took care of the main boys and administered their services to the sick and the wounded. Amy Bradley of East Valsborough also began her service as a nurse on September 1st, 1861, in the accompaniment of the 5th Maine Regiment. While many Maine women remained at home, they were active in their own way by contributing hours of their time and energy in organizations dedicated to providing the much needed supplies to the scene of the war. Ladies' relief organizations and societies were established in every small town and major city. Ladies rallied together with so much new shirt, with socks and gloves for the men at the front. These stories were shipped through organizations such as the U.S. Sanitary Commission and the Lady Aid Society to the scene of the war. Many women also provided care packages of canned blueberries, smells, baked potatoes, and other non-perishable goods which were needed. Main women and nurses were well renowned for the soldiers and were favored as caretakers and providers of much needed supplies. It is a fact that many soldiers from non-Maine regiments would state they were from Maine because they knew they would receive special care and supplies. Maine women's contributions, toils, and sacrifices to minister relief and consolation to the soldiers could not be overlooked. And that is why we have recognized them here today. Thank you. Uh, my job is to talk to you a little bit about Bethel in the Civil War. Bethel in 1860 had 25, 23 inhabitants. Uh, the largest recorded number in history. That means it equal to 474 households as opposed to over, over 800 now. It's interesting to note that uh, the size of those households are greatly reduced from, the, from that period. Uh, Lincoln won the vote in 1860, so he was in the hearts and minds of Bethel people. And one of the things that probably helped him, of course, was Hamlet Hamlin of South Paris from Paris Hill was on the, uh, on the ticket. We also have to remember that uh, Bethel had all, of, all kinds of range of experience for the Civil War. We even had a Copperhead in our midst. Yeah, as you know, Copperheads were those people that favored the South or were sympathetic to the South. Uh, a man named Sam Gibson, a lawyer, lived on uh, Spring Street, just up the street here, and he was one of those people that sympathized with the South. Um, we actually had uh, uh, eight men leave here in 1861 following the firing of Fort Sumter, and they were sent to vote the uh, Oxford Democrat to fight the putrid veteran of succession. Soon after that, the Bethel Rifle Guards were organized, and also later on the Bethel Home Guards. Many of them drilled on the uh, common up above us here. One of the most interesting uh, stories about the war was a man named Peter Bean, who uh, fought in the 16th Regiment. Uh, he died soon after returning home to Bethel because he spent uh, several months in uh, Libby Prison. And his experience uh, reminds me of the uh, Faulkner's words, the past is not dead, it's not even past. Uh, his story was told me by one of his relatives would be uh, 100 years old this year if he had lived. Um, and the story uh, deeply moved this man so much that he, he, he had tears in his eyes and his voice cracked and told me the story of Peter Bean in the winter of 1864 uh, having to uh, pull himself up each day after he'd fallen asleep because one of the sanitary conditions were anything but uh, wonderful in these prisons. And uh, he would stand as long as he could, finally fall asleep, 
his hair would freeze in the in the slime and the muck. And then in order to stand up, he'd have to pull his hair out of the ice in order to stand up each day. So it must have been a very pleasant experience to endure. But uh, this man had told me the story very much. I remember that his mother told him, and his mother had heard it from uh, relatives. And so this uh, legacy continues way into this present period. Uh, Bethel women worked uh, to supply the U.S. Sanitary Commission with all kinds of war supplies and aid for soldiers. Uh, this was under the auspices of the Union Aid Society, which also met on Spring Street, what was once Patty's Hall, uh, known later as the Grange Hall, later known as the Grange Hall Apartments. Uh, the war came home to Bethel people in many ways. Uh, we were constantly having town meetings to find aid for the various uh, members of the of the soldiers' families. Uh, there was a great deal of that going on. Um, and very often the town would be generous and then they'd rescind it or they'd reduce it. Uh, so this town, I think, was sort of divided on how much support they should give the soldiers' families. We find in February 1863, uh, a smallpox epidemic breaks out in North Bethel, brought home by one of the soldiers. Uh, we also learned from surviving letters about the Civil War soldiers. They were very homesick for their hometown. They always were talking about dear old Bethel. In 1864, an, an, an attempt to arrest a deserter in Bethel uh, was, was not uh, possible because apparently the guy uh, heard about it and ran away and never was found. In uh, two bunny jumpers, however, weren't so lucky. They were arrested in Bethel trying to make their way to Canada. Uh, one of the great stories of the war, of course, was Sergeant John Cooper, who had been reported to have been killed at Cedar Creek, and was his family relieved to see him come home alive and meet his own obituary in the newspaper. Probably the most lasting effect of the war upon many of its loyal sons, who we honor today, was the fact that the approximately 180 soldiers who served for Bethel, only about a third returned and stayed here. The Civil War had shown these men that they, there were other opportunities elsewhere, for most of them better than they could ever find in Maine, and so they moved to greener pastures, but Bethel would live on forever in their minds. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Reverend Leonard of the Third Main could not be with us this morning. So I'm going to take this opportunity to do the dedication of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I ask you that you open all of our hearts to what commitment these men made and women, to what it meant to them, to what it should mean to us that we ask that not only on this weekend, but for as long after as we can muster, the memories of your men and their tales and deeds will be forgotten in our hearts no longer. And it is in this spirit that I ask your blessing and the rededication of this monument in honor of all of our loyal sons who volunteered their services at the height of their lives with their careers alive before them because they felt the to a higher cause. We ask your blessings in these names. Amen. I would now ask, ladies relief, please lay the memorial wreath.
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our rededication services. I wish to thank you all very much for attendance. We will now reform our parade, march back up Main Street if we can. We will begin our living history cycle. Thank you very much. It's now nearing 12.15, um, time for the Confederate bank raid. You will notice there are Union guards walking about the parking area of the Key Bank. This was, it was a custom when a Union um, unit came into a community to guard the banks because the Confederates had no real money and uh, every time they were in a community uh, they had to make some effort to uh, find, refill their coffers, so as to speak. So uh, the guards are there. Um, I think they're, one of the things they want to do in this uh, reenactment is to chat with people who go by, chat with people who are interested enough to ask questions about why are you here, what are you doing. Um, we expect, if things are on schedule, and this morning's activities stayed very well on schedule, that uh, there should be some action happening here very soon. Uh, it's only perhaps about 10 after 12. So this kind of by the crowd here and see what we have. Can you look around a little bit here with the camera? After a slow start, there was really quite a, a good assembly of people uh, here for the uh, mining rededication of the monument. We're standing up on the steps of the Farmer Oddfellows Hall, which is now uh, known as the Lions Den. It's the Lions Club owns it, and uh, the VFW also meet here regularly. Uh, 
Well, I don't know whether the Confederates are lurking in the crowd or not. I don't seem to see any semblance of it. But um, those Union guards certainly are not as attentive as they might be if they were guarding uh, money for seriously. Confederate soldiers coming into view up there by the parking lot. Oh, one right there behind the bank. Okay. Oh, it's going to be in the midst. Are you? Are we on record now? Okay, Confederate soldiers have just been seen crossing the street. Uh, behind the post office block and behind the uh, key bank itself. There are three now coming coming right down. if the Confederates have done it this time. But now, I'm so busy watching it, I'm hardly seeing, but I think that the Confederate is leading off the Union uh, officer with his arms up, and uh, the man with the flute is leading away another, and this is how we should assume, I guess, that it was done, with, uh, but with real live bullets and uh, maybe some bloodshed, but there isn't even any ketchup on the ground today. And now we've seen another, another aspect of how it was in, between 1861 and 65. The Confederates desperate for money to buy the things they needed and uh, the Union Army trying to defend its banks wherever it went. Yeah, but Ted, the thing about the fun that we have, you really have to know what's going on. This gentleman like is from the first tree, and the artillery history, which is going to be the first one to demonstrate this afternoon, and he's getting ready for it. You will notice uh, some of the little things that they had in the Yes, yes, <laughs> it implies some level of research. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Perfect shot! Hold, it. Hold that pose! A little more eye on that one. I want a little more eye on that one. Basin and pitcher. Pull a strap up a little higher. And it looks as if he's got feminine This is, I got one really lunch on the about half an hour before the actual demonstrations for the camp. And we certainly can't recall the camp at all. So we're moving through the camp. Next to we definitely brought is the flag that says this is the 13th Alabama Infantry. You can see from there, beautiful. <laughs> These units are set up on the common mostly. We thought some were going to be across the street, but I think they're mostly all right here. 
uh, there's an inner row, and then there is a row that you can, of which you can see the fronts of the tents working upward toward the gazebo, uh, which is just uh, nearing completion and where the concert will be tonight. There will be a pretty good turnout. We hope that more people come to see the demonstrations. Let's move along. Hold on, folks. Oops. No one else is getting some here. There you go. That sounds good. Look up, guys. Yes. Yes, dude. Butternut puree. Oh, dear. Can you believe it took us four years to do that? The um, the firewood there is uh, has been uh, another acquired through another project of the bicentennial committee, as a matter of fact, in cooperation with uh, the Nova. Now the Knox Vocational Area forestry students, they have done some trimming and cutting out in Woodland Cemetery, which is being uh, uh, restored. What's this fellow cooking down underneath here? Cooking a twist of bread, crust, go with the squirrel meat. Would you like to try one? Oh, yeah. There was also a, a newspaper in there called The Young Republican, dated back 1862. Yeah, it's, it's not completely intact. Unfortunately, the mice have gotten to it, but you know, there's still quite a bit of it there. They went to, uh, they, they left by train and they stopped in New York and they were their union flag by the friends of New York. I'm sure it's the name. We were in New York at the time. The state preserved the flag and they carried it on to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The original flag oh, that's great. You know, that was used to bury Hyde and Barry, which was the commanding officer. Oh, it's the other types of the other part of it. Yeah. The living conditions, the reproduction of the cells, the trap, the seed, the archives, the campaigns, and the stampede, and what they did during the year. We had to create it. That's all part of the stampede. Yeah, less than 25% of the time. Now, what, what did you have to get that union to the uniforms? Okay, when they first started out, they were known as the Rockland City Grays. And that was the confusion in the Civil War. So the North was firing at the South, which was in the blue uniforms, and the vice versa until the, blue, until the North captured the wool mills that had the crazy wool and the blue wool and the dark blue wool uniforms. And that's the only reason the Civil War uniforms were wool is because that was the most readily available material at that time. And then it once the government adopted the standards for the uniform, then they had to go over again to be coming off the shooter gray and vice versa again. So it was a little confusing. All the units were uh, home hometown units, Bath City Gray, Rockwell City Gray, Dangor City Gray, that's what they were known as prior to the Civil War. 
but they had something, they had something similar to their names to make this one in. Actually, right. Even though it wasn't the right color. Right, exactly. Uh, I noticed that the unit over there where somebody is wearing a really green green. green. We can see in the computer. Those are called the Bredans. Uh, they were the sharpshooters of the Civil War. And the reason that they wore the green uniforms is because a lot of them were in trees and uh, they were forerunners like an advance party. And were like scouts and so forth, but they were all known as shops. It was the company in Portland, Company D, and the second Redan shop shooters. These two fellows here portrayed the whole company D, second man. Now, do you think that the Well, one of the Exactly. One of the known history facts is that the, there was more tactics learned from the uh, Civil War than any other war that we had to date, so it very well could be a carryover. We had French observers, Germans, from a lot of countries that were just observing the Civil War from day to day. How many soldiers under the age of 12? People. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, people, people have uh, uh, asses, did uh, they have hand grenades, did they have rifle muskets and rifle cannons? Yes, they had all that during the Civil War. Uh, they had the uh, observatories, which were balloons back then. They had signal platforms. They had quite a few different tactics. A lot of the stuff was developed in French, French names and so forth. But, uh, as I say, there was quite a few tactics during the Civil War. A lot of them used even still today. Yet raise your hand and say, are you over 16? Yes, I'm over 16. That's how you got the armor. What do you call the weapons? The rifles? The rifles? No, not, not that, but the, the general uh, ammunition, uh, guns. There. What do you call that? Musket. No, no, no. <laughs> The whole, the whole overall word that they use in the armory. No, um, munition. No. Ordnance. Ordnance. That, that it was in advance of their, uh, so far in advance of their transportation or logistical. Right. Well, also that and the uh, the uh, coming of the uh, special repeating rifle. That was noted if it had been developed earlier and issued earlier in the war, that probably the war would have been over earlier, and there would have been a lot less people killed. Larry, see my violin. The violin. I think they put it inside. These are very small. First main trade on primarily 24, 32 pounds. Some of the larger siege mortars. Plus, they also use these smaller mortars that you see over here. And they trained as artillerists and as infantry. If you never knew what you were going to need in those fortifications, you might need the artillery to drive off from the rebels, or they might need infantry to man the fortifications. So these men, 1800 strong, absolutely in letters back and forth, as you read back to their wives, we have a particular series of letters from uh, the war family uh, from Wellington. I'm in camp with her. Secretary Stanton was like, won't let us go fight. We'll stay here for the war. Well, it took someone And so, during the wilderness campaign, the first main heavy artillery, 800 strong, marched out of the forts. Their bathroom muskets, full dress parade uniforms, still wearing. Rock coat that see I'm wearing here instead of the, the short sack coat that you see the other gentleman wearing. Tie and this white shirt that you see, even white gloves that you want to get on. So all their equipment on their back. As they march, the veteran units would see them coming and say, and division Because Poland that had been taken on other units were such that a regiment of 1,800 soft strong looked like a full division of these men over here. 
and they would ride them and, sit and uncover a dead body on that side and push it into the swimming pool. So they got their first baptism of fire in the wilderness, a place called the Paris Barn. And the first thing they met first thing they met was the Lord I'm sorry. <laughs> Wasn't paying attention. I'd like to go up and interview the surgeon up there. Uh, Jim Rowe's been telling us about this and getting ready for it, but we can't seem to find him. He's coming down a minute to give us any introduce us around. Don't you just introduce us there? There you go. Where are you folks from? 
I'm from yeah. conducting over in the Bangor area. Yeah? Oh, you don't have to tell me where you are. You can tell me where you're from. Okay. Oh, I'm from Kenduskeg. Uh -huh. Work with an uh, artillery group known as Riley's Battery, That's where artillery is for 15th Alabama Regiment Rifles and old fireplaces. And where the Reds came over here and tried to show the insulin belly. What was that? How popular are you about real people who still carry fields I have not ever met any. That I everybody understands that it's a portrayal. There's two sides to every coin. Two sides to every coin. You know, we're not out here trying to degrade anything that was done. My, my, my great great grandfather was in the, uh, in the Union Army, and, and, uh, <laughs> but we we decided to show the other side of the coin. The 20th main was already in place when we decided to do the 15th Alabama. We couldn't figure a better outfit than to do the 15th Alabama because they came head to head at Getty. So we've been at it for three years now. And, uh, we're learning all the time. We study our history. And, you know, we try not to look ragtag. I realize that the Confederacy was, was uh, described as that way, but actually the 15th Alabama was pretty well supplied when they first went into, went into combat. We had, uh, we had 10 wagons full of equipment, uh, good uniforms, good weapons. We started off with good four stuff, but we got good stuff. We went into, uh, went into the Valley Campaign with General Jackson, Stonewall Jackson. We were part of his foot cavalry. Sometimes we do 37 miles a day and then fight, just for, just for pure pleasure. Then we got with Longstreet's Corps and, and uh, fought through Virginia, through uh, Gettysburg and Maryland. 15th Alabama was in a lot of, of battles. I can't, I haven't even begun to memorize everything, but they, they were around. First time, and one of the only times they suffered great defeats was, was at Gettysburg. That, that was the first time that they'd ever been broken out of formation. So they did, they, they got beat up bad. So they didn't have any water, it was five times up the hill. It was a tough day, tough day all around. <coughs> Can you see that thing? 
beyond this flag line. Just don't wander that way. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Dan said move back a little bit. You move back. Them two chickens are going to fly right off the bat. They better not, or I'm going to be a one-man charge that battery. Right. Why don't you take a chance? Hang around for the cannonball. You can do it. They'll all be in pieces. I'll scrape them off the white wall down there. Well, at least they'll be caught. Damn Yankees. <laughs> Trying to cook my chicken. <laughs> they think them birds are still alive. They got a load of the bird shot. <laughs> Just because I come over and snuck over and stole them last night doesn't mean you have to blow them off my spit. <laughs> I guess they've got a touched off. I think they could hit the dock even, even though that's not right. What? I think they could hit the dock if that ain't a right thing. The guy that's on this side, he's going to be no, no, really. from my I don't know what side. Ken and I work on Yeah, we just 
we played the song that was universally known as President Lincoln's favorite quickstep.
one more. Frog in the well. Another frog to it. I saw a hand go up on you. I just had a comment to make. We happen to know that the second graders, when he was in second grade, learned old man Tucker. Good. <laughs> and we'll be playing a, well, a formal military tattoo afterwards. But we're going to stick a whole bunch more tunes in there. So, uh, so we hope you'll come to the concert tonight and stick around to hear that. We're going to do one more that's called Frog in the Well. Oh. We may have had lyrics at one time. But, uh, yeah, right. Kind of like, it's kind of dangerous to play right after Old Man Tucker. I think it's almost the same. I think it's the same.
We take new recruits. We're a family-oriented unit, and wives and children are welcome. Now, where is your home base? Waterville, Delaware. You know, Fort Knox on Prospect, Maine. Sure. Yeah. Actually, most people think it's Bucksport, but that's actually Prospect. Yeah. That's our home. That's the Plains Maine's home base. You're a Belfast. I was born in Belfast. Oh, really? Yes. And what's your name? Gross. Gross? Yes. Oh, one of my class. I used to class name. Paul Gross and... Is that Granville? What? Granville. Granville. That's my father. The war. There was everybody signed up for all ages. Um, but as it went on, things started to drop off and get whittled down. Um, Maybe we're more susceptible to patriotism, perhaps. I don't know why it was that way, but uh, it just happened to be. Um, it, it, I, I'd be more probably in a later war. Um, yeah, the end of the war, you'd see people all people But we didn't last very long. No, no, no. <laughs> no. See, you didn't finish us awesome. yeah, In terms of constitution, <laughs> uh, and physical vitality, <laughs> I just want to put in a plug that I uh, I represent the artillery. We have we have two groups uh, that are sort of intermingled. Uh, many of us from the 20th Maine have also uh, become involved in the 6th Maine Battery uh, Artillery. We have a Parrot rifle that we use right over there. That's that's one on the. The one on the very end, yeah. Uh, so we do we do both infantry uh, with the rifles and the artillery units. We're also looking for recruits. Yeah. Uh, You know, I, we really appreciate coming to places where people appreciate what we're doing, uh, and that's what we found here, is that people are interested, they ask good questions, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. You know, our, our job is primarily educational, we like to have fun with it, you know, it's our hobby, but we also like to keep, uh, just keep the idea of the Civil War alive in people's minds, and uh, we found people here very receptive. Well, this is this is one of my kids right here. He was one of my students in uh, seventh and eighth grade, and uh, this is what happened to him. to tell the kids that they're probably the last generation that will know people who knew people that were in the Civil War. There are, you know, there are still people around today who can remember when they were children, you know, their grandfathers and great grandfathers who were in the Civil War. And that generation is, is pretty well gone. Yeah. 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 So it, it does give some connection, you know, there's some connection there that at least they have known people who knew people, and that's, you know, that's disappearing. Right, I represent probably the average Union soldier. There were infinite variations throughout the war due to um, state issue or regular army, but this is what was the standard uniform for the majority of Union soldiers throughout the war. Um, they were issued, these are called Jefferson Brogans, 
Um, it's a just rough leather turned out with a nailed onto a cork sole. Um, they're very hard. There's no cushioning at all. Um, they had cork insoles, but at the same time, they're still very hard on your feet. Um, another problem with the cork soles, they uh, wore down very easily. You can see um, I have something like a horseshoe on the bottom. Um, that was called the heel plate, and that was to keep the heel from wearing away on a march. Um, if I didn't have that heel plate on there, it, inside of 10 miles, I'd probably have holes in my shoes. So those heel plates serve to protect my feet. Um, there are right and left. Uh, some shoes didn't, they just molded to your feet, but these in particular are a right and left footed shoe. Um, my trousers are made of 18 ounce wool, which is incredibly heavy, um, and it's very rough. Um, the reason it had to be so heavy was because they were basically issued one uniform. Um, they were issued overcoats, but essentially they had one uniform for winter and summer, so they had to find some sort of happy medium with the uniforms. Um, the only problem was these were too hot in the summer, and they really were pretty chilly in the winter. Um, they're pretty itchy, and as I said, quite hot, but um, they're, they're rugged, and they serve for a while. Um, men would wear these every day for two or three years. Um, they were supposed to be issued a pair of trousers a year, but that didn't always come through. Um, the jacket I'm wearing is also made of 100% wool. It's, um, it's a little lighter. It's 10 ounce wool. And uh, this is just a standard sack coat um, with the four brass buttons on the front. There were, again, variations. There were the frock coats with the longer tails and uh, shell jackets, which were shorter but had more buttons. But this is just the standard infantryman's coat. Um, underneath, I'm wearing just uh, a cotton shirt. It, soldiers were issued wool battle shirts, but understandably, they're very hot um, and not real nice next to your skin. Um, but they did bring shirts from home. That's one thing. Soldiers didn't have many duplicates, but they usually carried several shirts with them. Um, several pairs of sh uh, underdrawers and several shirts. They'd bring those from home. Um, it's just a homespun shirt with several buttons down the front. No, no collar on them. Um, the cap I'm wearing is called a forage cap because uh, it comes from a French design. And they're called forage caps because you could forage with them. You could pick up berries or nuts. Um, they uh, work pretty well with water, too. They hold water for a little while to drink. Um, let's see. On top of my hat, uh, that's sort of a army-wide identification system, which is inter introduced by uh, General Hooker after the Battle of Fredericksburg. It was... Um, mainly a morale booster it was supposed to be. And what it is is the uh, brass horn indicates that I'm in the infantry. If I was in the cavalry, I'd have cross sabers. And if I was in the artillery, there would be two cross cannon barrel. But it's uh, a brass horn, so I'm in the infantry. Um, if you can see that uh, red Maltese cross underneath the letter B, um, that indicates a core. Um, as you know, the army is divided into corps, and then into division, then into brigade, regiment, and so on. Um, a corps was made. A corps in the Union Army was made up of about 7,000 men. It was supposed to be, of course, battle would whittle that down. But it was prescribed to be about 7,000 men. Um, the fact that this is a Maltese cross, the shape of it indicates that it is the Fifth Corps. Um, the fact that it's red indicates that it's the first division of the fifth corps. If it was second division, it would be white. If it was third division, it would be blue. The regimental numbers, the two and the O, I split it up, um, but it, that, that's 20, because I'm in the 20th Maine. Um, and B is company designation, so I'm in company B. It goes A, B, C, D, and so on, up to 10 companies. So um, from this, you can determine that I'm in the 20th Regiment, Company B, from whatever state, it happens to be Maine. Um, Fifth Corps, First Division, Army of the Potomac. So that, that's just a little interesting side note. Um, these lasted for a while. They tended to fall off. They're not attached by much. So if they were lost, it was no big deal because soldiers just had to keep them polished and it was more hassle than it was worth. Um, so to go on, um, you can see that I'm wearing a lot of brass. Um, 
this brass is it was fairly difficult to keep polished, even though they were supposed to. Um, often things would mysteriously get lost. Um, who knows, the soldiers threw them away or if they just fell off. Um, some people say that soldiers chucked the breastplates around 1863 or so because it gave a good target to shoot at. At the same time, I like to think that if you've got 4,000 men lined up in front of you walking towards you, you don't need much of a target to shoot at. So, who knows, maybe they took them off, maybe they just fell off. But um, this is fairly shiny. They, it, as the war went on, they tended to get real green and nasty and uh, caked up. Um, the leather gear that I'm wearing is uh, purely functional, really, um, just a, a belt. The belt doesn't hold anything up other than my gear. It's not for my pants. Um, I wear suspenders underneath. Um, what I've got here is uh, a cap pouch. And I keep all my uh, caps in here. Percussion rifles, I'll explain about the rifle in a minute. Percussion rifles were a modification of a flintlock rifle, which was used during, mainly during the Revolutionary War. Um, and you just have this little primer cap, and it's got a dot of mercuric oxide. And when this was smashed, it would make a spark, which went into the chamber, which ignited the powder, which sent the bullet out the end. So you keep all this right in there, right on your belt, so you can get at it easily. Um, I've got a bayonet, a, a scabbard for my bayonet. I'll explain about that later. Um, here is just a standard 32 ounce canteen. Um, the one I've got here is made of stainless steel. That's cheating a little bit, but uh, the regulation canteens, which looked exactly the same, were made of tin and then they were lined with beeswax. But what would happen is the beeswax would flake off and then the tin would rust through. So for a while you'd have really nasty water and then eventually you just have no canteen. So in order to save myself a little money, I got the stainless steel version, but it looks exactly the same. Um, in here, I've got, well, this is called a haversack. Um, soldiers did have knapsacks um, that they'd strap on their back and they'd carry their bedroll on top, but the knapsacks were sort of unwieldy and they were, they weren't, soldiers weren't allowed to take them into battle because they restrict your movement. Um, what a soldier kept in here was everything that he absolutely needed. Um, and he may be an extra shirt or maybe an extra pair of underdrawers, but probably not. What he kept in here mainly was his plate, um, his uh, knife and fork and spoon, um, maybe three days rations if he had it, uh, perhaps a pipe, some form of tobacco, um, if he had dice or cards, he'd keep them in there. Um, any little token, maybe of home, a, a little picture, um, anything that was small and portable and lightweight, he'd keep in there. Um, also, sometimes they kept extra rounds of ammunition in there, but um, generally in there. Uh, cartridge box. Um, so a soldier would keep what he absolutely needed on his person in the haversack. He'd put most extra clothes and books or whatever he had in a knapsack. Um, oh. In this cup, a cup was a soldier's best friend. Um, it's a very heavy duty cup. It's not just a standard tin cup. Um, soldiers ate out of these, they drank out of them, they dug with them, they did essentially everything that it could be used for with them. Uh, you'll find very few of these intact, at least originals. Um, but this is a very heavy cup, um, fairly sturdy. Um, they, they'd cook in them, they'd put them in the fire, they'd just set, uh, they'd boil coffee in them, and they carried them right here on their haversack for easy use. Um, on the other side, I've got a cartridge box, which is where you keep all his cartridges. Soldiers were issued their cartridges in packages of 10. Um, and there would be 10 cartridges, something like this. This doesn't have a mini ball in it, but uh, there would be a mini ball at the lower end and powder on top. It would be greased with some sort of animal fat um, to make it slide down easier. They were issued these in packages of 10 with 12 caps um, in a package. Uh, the caps, the extra caps, were used for clearing after you fired to make sure that you don't have extra powder down in your barrel. Um, so they issued these and they kept them in, uh, I don't, let's see, I'll try to angle that, in, in little tins, they just uh, stack them in. You could hold roughly 80 to probably 100 rounds in, full, uh, in, in a cartridge box and with lead it get fairly heavy. Um, 
and the, the little U.S. plate is just the United States Army. Um, the only other part now is the actual arm. This is standard infantryman's arm. Again, there were variations throughout the war. There were repeaters. Um, there, there were repeating rifles as early as 1860, but the War Department, for some reason, didn't like them. It wasn't a standard arm, so they really didn't buy them in large numbers. So. By the end of the war, they came into the Union Army with some bit of frequency, but uh, for the most part, it was a single shot, rifled musket. This isn't quite a rifle, but it's not a musket. Muskets are smooth bored and they also had a very thin barrel. This has a thicker barrel, barrel wall, and it's rifled, but it's still um, got the length and the weight of a musket. Um, this was, uh, Enfield was a British manufacturer. Um, many were bought from Belgium, from Austria. The two, uh, there was an American version of this, the Springfield which was actually a little better. It didn't jam as frequently. It was a little later of an arm. Um, it was, uh, what, Daddy? you'll see them, some people have them, the silver barreled ones, but it's essentially the same. It's a rifled musket. Uh, Enfields, as I said, were British, Springfields were American. Um, this weighs nine and a half pounds, which is fairly heavy, especially on a long march. Um, that's what the sling is for. Um, soldiers didn't always have to march like this when they got on the route they went into route step, which was, uh, they, they could basically carry their arm any way they want. So, this, um, if any of you have seen Glory, a good man can fire three shots a minute, and that's about the upper limit. Um, you had to go through the whole nine times of loading um, with, with the ramrod and whatnot, and return it, and it wasn't a very, um, you know, it wasn't a rapid fire weapon but these were about as powerful as they needed to be, and they were very long range. Um, they fired a mini ball, which was an ounce of lead, soft lead, and an ounce of lead is equivalent to a 20 gauge shotgun slug, but whereas most shotguns are good to about 150 yards with any degree of accuracy, these were very accurate to 400 yards. They kill at 1,000. Um, in 1860, they did a, uh, the War Department did a test of uh, Springfields and Enfields, and they found that 100 yards, they could get a dozen balls, mini balls, inside, I think it was uh, about a two-foot square. And then they did a penetration test um, with um, spacing pine boards an inch thick. They'd have a pine board, an inch of space, a pine board, an inch of space. At 100 yards, a mini ball fired from one of these would go through 11 pine boards, the 22 inches and that's many bodies lined up. Um, at 300 yards, these were still inside a square of about four feet, and they would penetrate, uh, I think it was four or five boards. So considering most fighting was done inside 200 yards, at least with rifles, um, these were very effective um, weapons. Not quite um, of, of the caliber, say, of a World War I rifle. That's when they got into the incredibly high powered like the Mausers and the um, later model Springfields. Those are the ones that will just knock you over, but at the same time these were very powerful. Um, I think that I have a mini ball, my haversack, that's right here. That, if you, the rifling grooves on there would catch the rifling grooves in there. Um, that's a conical mini ball before it has been fired or before it's hit anything. Um, now, this is a 58 caliber bullet, by the way. Yeah. Now, this is a mini ball that has hit something. That's about 80 caliber. Now, a bullet like this would just obliterate anything that it hit. Um, even today, they couldn't do much about it other than cut out the bone and replace it with Teflon, which they understandably couldn't do during the Civil War. Um, so these are very devastating weapons. Um, they also had a nice attachment, it was the bayonet. Um, this is a tri-cornered bayonet, which was banned in 1868 by the Geneva Convention because it uh, caused a wound that would not heal. Um, it, it, it caused a, a puncture wound, not a slice wound. Um, if you see today's bayonets, in fact, every bayonet after the Civil War era is essentially like a survival knife, just a straight, straight edge. This. Um, has blood grooves in it, which was so that when there was blood running down, 
it wouldn't come straight into your barrel and muck up the powder. Um, bayonets, although they were often fixed, um, they weren't really used with any frequency to harm people. More often than not, um, they'd, uh, soldiers would cook with them or they'd dig with them. So when they actually were used, they'd often be very dull. But when you've got nine pounds of momentum and then any adrenaline that's thrown into it, it would certainly go into somebody. At the same time, um, I think in Union records of 250,000 wounds that were treated during the Civil War, 900 were from bayonets or sabers, which works out to 0.0037%, I think it was. So um, the reason bayonets weren't used very often is because it's very hard to bayonet somebody. Um, it's a very personal thing. It's like stabbing somebody. More often than not, instead of using their bayonet, soldiers would pick up their weapons and just club or use rocks or whatever or hand to hand. Um, so bayonets were more of a scare tactic than an actual. MIDI come from in MIDI world? The guy who developed it. Um, oh, was that a was French name? colonel, I think he was. Um, yeah, Claude Minet. Um, it's uh, M I N I E, a little accent thing. So, it, yeah. it was developed in the MIDI. Oh god, um, well I just graduated from high school, I play lacrosse, I play soccer, I swim, hang out. Nice presentation. Thank you. You're an exceptional soldier. Thank you. guy who developed it. Um, oh, was that a was French it? colonel, I think he was. Um, yeah, Claude Minet. Um, it's uh, M-I-N-I-E, a little accent thing. So, it, yeah. it was developed in the beginning.